In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we do thank you and bless your name for this privilege, opportunity to come before you as your servants, as leaders in the church, as workers in the church, workers in the vineyard of the Lord. We're asking, O oh Lord, your word will penetrate and transform every life more than ever before today in Jesus' name. Bless us so we can be a blessing to all the people. Let's reflect, help us to reflect your word, the light, and the glorious heritage you have given us, the Bible, in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say, great, great, amen. God bless you. We can be seated tonight. We come to Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word of Christ, the word of God, the word of the Father, the word of revelation from heaven. Let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in the psalms and the hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace, living with grace, acting with grace, behaving with grace in your heart to the Lord. And then in verse 17 it says, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It says, let the word of God, the word of Christ, the word of revelation, let it dwell in us richly. Tonight, we're looking at the Bible in dwelt spirit, spirit controlled Christian. A Christian born again. A Christian, he has known the Lord. A Christian, he loves the Lord. A Christian is Christ-like. And he is indwelt by the Bible, indwelt by the promises of God, indwelt by the precepts in the Bible, indwelt by everything that is revealed. And he can say every time, he can live every time by the words it is written. And he's spirit controlled the scripture and the spirit. The scripture without the spirit will make us traditional, will make us like the Pharisees having the scriptures in the head and not having the spirit in our heart to lead us, to control us. But the spirit without the scripture will make us fanatical. We'll say the spirit said, the spirit said, the spirit said, and the scripture has not said. It will make us false and fanatical and, and uh, we will be uh, all fire without the focus where to direct the fire. But when you have the two the scripture indwelling in our heart and the spirit controlling us, then we're real Christians following after Christ. For it is Christ that said that his temptation, it is reaching. And then he said, my father taught me and gave me the word. What I do therefore, I do by the spirit of God. He says, if I cast out spirits by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. There is the combination of the scripture and the spirit, the Bible and the spirit combining together to make us the kind of Christ-like man, Christ-like woman we ought to be. In Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 6, Joshua chapter 1 verse 6, it says, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto these, these people shall thou divide for an inheritance Returns the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Only be thou strong and very courageous. What's going to make us strong? What's going to make us courageous? It's not the natural ability. It is not uh, the uh, secular learning. It is the scripture, the word of 
God. We see how he dealt with people and, uh, and the prophets and the preachers of old, how he strengthened them. And we see that God is an impartial God. If he strengthened them, if he helped them, if he lifted them up, if he put his word in their mouth and it's not a partial God, he can do the same thing for us. How do we become strong? We're strong in the spirit of the Lord. We're strong because the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, energizes us. He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And when the scripture dwells in us and the spirit abides in us and controls us, it makes us strong. It makes us very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. And then it says, it says, turn not from each to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper with whithersoever thou goest. Then in verse 8 it says, this book of the law. That was all that was written at that time from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And Joshua was just called into the ministry. All they had, you understand, David had not come, the Psalms had not been written. And all the prophets writing, prophets Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and, um, and Isaiah had not come. So all that had not been written. And Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and John, they had not come. Because of that, all he had was the book of the law. Now we have not just the book of the law, we have the book of the Lord. We have everything from, Gen from Genesis uh, to Revelation. And it says now, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. It's not only to read, it's not only to study in our, you know, lonely, lonely time and our uh, separate time, personal time that we have. We meditate, we turn over and over, we ruminate. We think about and we analyze and we apply those words that we have heard, we have learned, we have read unto ourselves. And we ask, how does that affect my behavior, my character, my output, and the outcome of the life I live? We observe to do, we meditate, and then it says, we meditate therein on what is written, then shalt thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. As I've said tonight, we're looking at the Bible in dwelt, spirit controlled Christian. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the Christian in the Bible, which is complete. The, the Bible is now complete. We want to see the Christian in the Bible. Number two, the Christian in the body of Christ. Number three, we're looking at the Christian as a believer and as a conqueror. Look at number one. Number one is the Christian in the Bible. The Bible which is now complete. Look at the Christian in Acts chapter 11 and we're looking at verse 26. Acts 11. We're looking at verse 26. And when he had found him, when Barnabas had found Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who had now become born again, a real Christian, he brought him unto Antioch. Barnabas brought Saul to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled together themselves together with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. These people came together, they read the Bible, they expounded the Bible, they explained the verses of the Bible, they applied the word of God to the people that were coming to that fellowship, to that assembly, and to that church. And they did that 
probably every day and they touch much people. Their lives changed. Their lives were transformed. And as they went outside and lived like Christ and behaved like Christ and interacted like Christ, the disciples, those who were learners, those who were disciples, they were called Christians. They look like Christ. They talk like Christ. They behave like Christ. They're no more like the pagans. They're no more like the traditionalists. They're not no more like just religious people. Because of that, the people called them Christians, Christ-like people. And that's what is emphasized in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, This book of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. That's what those people did. The people that were taught at Antioch. The people that received the word and they received the Christ of the word. They, when they received the word, then they behaved and lived like Christ wanted them to live. And it says, they will meditate day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. According to all we don't choose some peak and sit. I like this, I accept this, I don't accept that. We accept everything and we live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. And it says, all that was written, that is written therein, for then, only then will God support you. Only then will God sustain you. Only then will God strengthen you. Only then will God make you to prosper. For only then shalt thou make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Let's look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the Christian as a fruitful branch. We're looking at the Christian number two as a faithful bride. Number three, we're looking at the Christian as a fortified bridge. When we say Christian, we're connected with Christ. We're dwelling in Christ. We're abiding in Christ. And it is that connection with Christ that makes grace to flow into our lives and the power to be and the power to do dwells within us. Let's look at one there. The Christian as a fruitful branch. He tells us in John chapter 15 verse 1. Verse 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. And then in verse 2 it says, every branch in me. That's Christ. We're connected with Christ because we're Christians. Because we're born again. Because we're not becoming branch in the vine. It says every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, the Father, taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, he cleanses. He purges and takes off redundant things out of our lives that they it may bear forth, bring forth more fruit. When we become born again, we we'll begin the commencement of bearing fruit. Our lives are transformed. Our lives are changed. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. But that's just a commencement. A commencement. Now we continue, continue, and it purges us, and it teaches us, and it cleanses us, and it produces more fruit in our lives. It tells us in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, now ye are clean. Some people say those disciples were not born again. They were born again. It says now you're different from the world. You're no more like the world. Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Reading from verse 4. In verse 4 it says, abide in me. You are in me already. Abide. They were born again. And then it says, and I in you. They were born again. How could Christ be in them if they were not born again? If they were not transformed? If they were not new creatures? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, I am the vine and ye are 
the branches. As the branches were uh, attached to the vine, to the trunk of the tree, so these disciples, they were attached to him. They were born again. They were new creatures in Christ. They were sons and daughters of God. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. He's spoken about fruit. He's spoken about more fruit. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Verse 16. In verse 16 it tells us, Ye, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. How can theologians say that those people that had been chosen by the Lord? In another verse, uh, chapter 17, it says, I've given them your word, and they have received your word. And they're no more of the world because the world now hates them. It says very clearly here, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should uh, go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And then it says that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. We're well, looking at Romans chapter 11 verse 16. Romans chapter 11 verse 16 is the fruit. It's the fruit that God is looking for, that Christ is looking for, that even the world that they're looking for to prove and to show and to declare without any shadow of doubt that we are now Christians. It says for if the first fruit be holy, then the lamb also is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. We're branches in the vine. And because we're branches in the vine, we bear fruit. It says, if the tree itself and the root is holy, then the branches are holy. In verse 22, in verse 22, it tells us, behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue and abide in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. He's looking for fruit, and it will bear the fruit when we attach to him, but without him, if we do not continue that attachment and that connection with Christ, we will not continue to bear fruit. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Those who have not come into the Lord, those who are not branches in the tree that is and the vine and they are not abiding in Christ. It says this will be their character. This will be their lifestyle. Our character will show whether we are outside Christ or we are in Christ. Our character will show whether we are severed, separated branches that is thrown away left to dry and left for the fire or we're attached to the Lord, connected with the Lord and we have the fruit that he expects of the people that abide in the vine. It says uh, the works of the flesh are manifest which are these? Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20, in verse 20, it tells us idolatry, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, anger, fighting, strife, seditions, false, uh, false uh, doctrine, heresies. Looking at verse 21, it says envies and murders, drunkenness, revelings and, uh, of, and so like it goes on and on of the which I tell you before that is I tell you before the day of judgment comes as I have told you in time past as I've revealed to you in my messages Paul is saying I've, I've told you in time past that they all of them man woman boy girl young old that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom 
kingdom of God. Those who show evidence that they are not living in Christ, they are not abiding in Christ, they are not connected to Christ, they don't have the grace and the strength and the power to live the victorious life. It says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but then the fruit will bear, the fruit will produce, the fruit that increases, the fruit that comes more and more, and the fruit that becomes much in our lives. When we abide in the vine, when we abide in Christ, it tells us in verse 22, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. In verse 23, it says meekness, humility, and temperance, self-control. Against such there is no law. Then in verse 24, it says, and they which are Christ's, they which belong to Christ, they which are disciples of Christ, they are Christians. It says they have crucified the flesh. Uh, you don't need another person to crucify the flesh for you. That will be the person who's persecuting you, but yourself. Because you abide in Christ. And because you want to bear fruit, you are bearing fruit, you want to bear much fruit and more fruit, you crucify the flesh with the affections and the laws. In verse 25, it says, if we live in the Spirit, if we are scripture saturated, if we are scripture indwelt. If we are filled with the scriptures and we're filled with the spirit and controlled by the spirit, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let our action, let our production, let our lifestyle reflect. We're now in Christ and we've crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws thereof. We're looking at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the Christian as a faithful bride. The Christian as a faithful bride. Uh, yes, use the picture of the tree. It's not using the picture of the family. And we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 2. It says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. It says, uh, Paul the Apostle says, all these converts that have come to the Lord is jealous over them with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ the bride of Christ in verse 3 it says but I fear, lest any by any means as the serpent beguiled and deceived and tripped Eve through his subtlety, so your, uh, your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of Christ. Paul the Apostle said, I've betrothed you, I've warned you, I've wooed you to Christ. Who becomes your bridegroom? Who becomes your husband? Who becomes your head? And now I fear, lest by any means that the serpent, the old serpent, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, beguiled and deceived Eve to sin. But look at that thing. How do you think, what do you think it looks like? Is it not good and beautiful? And is it not pleasant? Uh, we don't know what is pl pleasant in what God has forbidden. God said, don't eat and uh, don't have anything to do with that. And it is that that is wrong. It is that that is forbidden uh, that looks pleasant and something to make them wise. And he said, the old serpent beguiled deceived and made him, made her, and of course Adam later to tree, uh, to tree, so that uh, they, they slid and they went back from the Lord, they backslid. It says, so your heart and your mind and your thinking and your thoughts processes be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Christian is a bride and it shall remain a 
faithful bride. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he may sanctify and cleanse it in the home if the wife you know does not take her bath for one week for one month how does that look like coming out and she has not taken her bath for one whole month and it is the word that acts like water and cleanses us what does a christian look like the bride of christ what does he look like if he does not wash in the word if he does not birth in the word if he does not cleanse himself herself by the word it says that he might sanctify and cleanse each of the washing of water by the word in Verse 27, it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, the bride, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, without blemish, blameless. That's what Christ wants his bride to be so that we we'll become a faithful bride. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19 verse 7. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his his wife, the bride, has made herself ready. Made herself ready. We're not ready for the rapture if we're not clean. We're not ready for the coming of the Lord if we're not purged, if we're not purified, if we're not holy, if we're not sanctified. He wants his bride to be faithful. Faithful to the word and faithful to the Lord and faithful in everything he has given us to do. And that's the only way we're ready for him. And now we're looking at number three, the Christian now has a fortified bridge. A fortified bridge. What's beach, the bridge for? The bridge is for people to go on, uh, to move on, and to drive on. That he is on this side, and Christ is on that side. And you, as the, as the bridge, you want to allow people through you, through your life, and through your commitment, through your consecration, and through through your lifestyle, they see Christ. They see Christ there and they see Christ through you and then they can move uh, through you to Christ. If we're not bridges, we're barriers. If we become a barrier unto the people that need to get to Christ, we're no more living the Christian life. And some people wanted to see Jesus and disciples said, drive her away because he cries after us. That's not being a bridge. That's a barrier. And the children were brought to the Lord. And, uh, you know, the, the disciples forbid them. Don't trouble the master. We're not uh, bridges then. We're barriers. He wants the Christian to be a bridge. A bridge that people can see from what I see in his life. From what I see in her life. From the purity and the sanctification and the holiness. And from the gentleness and the meekness. From the humility. I observe in this person's life, I want to be like that. I want to come to Christ because he or she has known Christ, the Christian, as a fortified bridge. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 18. And all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation. When two people are apart, they are not in agreement, and somehow they turn their backs against each other, and you want to reconcile them. You cannot be frowning. You cannot be taking sides. You cannot be pointing accusing finger. You cannot uh, be rebuking this and then uh, uh, kind of pressing this. You have to be a peacemaker and 
God wants people to come to him. And the people that will do that, they're the people that have the love of God and they have the gentleness of the spirit and they have the life of Christ in them and they show concern for the death of Christ. Christ died for this person and whatever I can do in all godly wisdom to bring him to Christ, I want to be a bridge. That is the Christian and all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation then verse 19 to which that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them. When we go to reconcile people we're not accusing them, we're not condemning them, we're not explaining how bad, how rotten they are, we're not telling them they are not even, they are not free to even come to Christ. The door must be open. You must be a bridge to say what you need to say about Christ, about Christ, much about Christ, so that this person will be attracted to want to come to Christ. He says, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors for Christ. And it says that though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We're looking at Mark chapter, uh, sorry, we're looking at um, Zechariah chapter 8 verse 16. In Zechariah chapter 8, looking at uh, verse 16, I will remain at the bridge. I will remain the connector, the connection between the sinner and Christ the Savior. In Zechariah chapter 8 verse 16, these are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute judgment, justice of truth, and peace in your gates. In verse 17, verse 17, and let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Whoever those neighbors are, all we want of them is to know the Lord, is to come to the Lord and be made fit, ready for heaven. And it says, for all these things that I hate, says the Lord. And then in verse 23, verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days when we become the bridge and the facilitator of people coming to the Lord, I want to help them. I want to show them the way. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And when we want to point out that way, with our lives, with our language, with our witnessing, and with everything that we do. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men, ten women, ten people shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard, for we have seen, for we have known by your life, by what we see, by what we hear, and by the grace of God in your life, we have heard, we have known that God is with you. Those are Christians, those are the people that are fortified bridges between the world and our mighty God. We're coming to Mark chapter 2 now verse 14. In Mark chapter 2 verse 14, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, that's Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, follow me, 
and he arose and followed him. Look at the next verse in verse 15. He became a bridge to people like him, to publicans like him, to sinners like he was. He became a bridge so that they can go through him and come to Christ and hear of repentance and hear of faith in Christ and hear of a new life, regenerated life. It says in verse 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house. In the previous verse, he had just become a disciple. He had become a convert. He had become a follower of Christ. And now he invited Christ to himself so that he can bring other people that will hear what he has heard, that will know what he has known, and that will know Christ as Savior. And so it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and he and his disciples and then he says there were many and there were many and they followed him we're coming to point number two now point number two we're looking at the Christian in the body of Christ the Christian when we become Christians we don't stay at home in isolation and say I have the Bible I can read the Bible I can hear the message from the social media Media, and so I stay by my by myself alone. And I can so read and develop. I can so read and learn. I can so read and study and remain a Christian, a child of God. Maybe you can, but the will of God is that you come to be built up with the body, the body of Christ. It says the Christian in the body of Christ. We're looking at um, First Peter chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 15. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 15, we're looking at the Christian now, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. You're a Christian now, or as a thief, you're a Christian now, or as an evil doer, you're a Christian now, or as a busy body in other men's matters. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, but if any man suffer as a Christian. Who's a Christian? A Christian is someone that so believes in Christ that he carries out his conviction no matter where he is. And because he carries out his conviction, which is contrary to the attitude of the world, the behavior of the world, the worldly people that will not understand him, why is he living like that? Why is he so quiet like that? Why is he so meek like that? Why is he so gentle, so humble like that? And why is he just not worshiping in our idols with us and he's not doing all the things we want him to do because he's a Christian because of that he'll suffer persecution it says yet if any man suffer as a Christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God on this behalf we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 12 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ, of the body of Christ. If you stay in isolation at home, you cannot edify the body of Christ. If you stay separate from the body of Christ and you are not in the body of Christ, you cannot edify the body of Christ, but he wants us to edify the body of Christ. Look at verse 13, verse 13, till ye all come in the unity of the faith. If you are isolated, you are not built into the body of Christ, into the church of the living God, you will not grow to that uh, maximum level. But it says, until we all come in the unity of the faith and in of the knowledge of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. You cannot be perfect or perfected all by yourself. 
I don't want to come to fellowship. I uh, see the COVID time. I've been, you know, staying at home and I get everything I want to get. Everything there is online. You will not be together with the people of God, the body of Christ, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. Three things we're looking at here. We're looking at number one, the Christian born into his spiritual family. Number two, the Christian built on a solid foundation. Number three, the Christian baptized in the Spirit's fire. Look at number one. Number one is the Christian born again into the spiritual family. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, it says, Of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. The family of God, patch, have died, and they have gone to heaven. Two have been raptured, and have gone to heaven. And that family of God, believers in the Lord, born into the spiritual family, patch on earth and patch in heaven. And then it tells us in John, John chapter 3, reading from verse 3, it said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The disciples had been born again and they saw the kingdom of God. They entered into the kingdom of God. That's why he sent them forth that they will preach and heal and that they will tell the people the kingdom kingdom of God is come unto you. If they had not entered the kingdom, they cannot go and tell other people. They cannot say the kingdom is come unto you. It tells us in verse 5, in verse 5 it says, Jesus answered, verily, verily I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, the water of, of the word and of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In verse 6 it says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and the works of the flesh he will do. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit and the fruit of the spirit he will bear. In verse 7, verse 7 says, Marvel not that I said unto thee ye must be born again. In Second Corinthians we're reading from chapter 6 and verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You are believers, they are unbelievers. You are Christians, they are non-Christians. Be not yoked with them. Don't be yoked with them in marriage. Don't be yoked with them in business. Don't be yoked with them in rioting. Don't be yoked with them in practicing what practices be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers because you are Christian for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness then it tells us in verse 15 it says and what concord has Christ with Belial or what patch has he that believeth with an infidel. In verse 16, it says, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. 
that's a Christian. I will dwell in them. The God indwelt man or woman. The Christ indwelt man or woman. Christ dwells in us when we become Christians. And because he lives in us, our lives are different. That is the Christian. I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, it says, Wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. Uh, uh, that's what uh, Adam and Eve, uh, that's what they disobeyed. They touched the forbidden thing. And the glory of God departed from them. And the joy of belonging departed from them. And the fellowship and relationship that they had with God departed from them. And they were driven out of the garden of Eden, the garden of God. It tells us the same thing. It says if we're going to be the branch in the vine if we're going to be the bride of the bridegroom, if we're going to be the bridge that gets people to Christ, if we're going to show that we're born into the family of God, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And in verse 18, it says, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We're looking at number two here. Number two, the Christian built on his solid foundation. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19, it's not only that we're born and then we're an isolated block outside the building. We're brought into the building and we're built into the building, the building habitation of God. It says, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of the family of God. In verse 20, it says, and are built upon the foundation. If we're Christians, were built together. Uh, the conviction of the Spirit will be on us, and the desire of the Lord will be in us that we will want to be part of the body. But if we are so isolated and alone, we have nothing to do with the body for us. Uh, we are the angel and the body. Look at the body. They are not as clean as they ought to be. And because of that, I don't want to associate with anybody body. And no church is perfect. And because no church is perfect, I want to stay. I am perfect and purified and perfected so I cannot join an imperfect church. Look at this. It says and were built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophet Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In verse 21 verse 21 says in who all the building fitly framed together. That's the will of God. You are built because you are a Christian, because you are born again, because you belong to Christ. Christ is the foundation. You are built on that foundation. You know, all the building framed frame, frame together fitly grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In verse 22, verse 22 says, in whom ye also are built together. Christian, not isolated, not separated, not severed from the, uh, from the whole body. It says we're built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, the Christians. 
Christ, Christian, Christ-like. He knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, every Christian, every Christian, depart from iniquity. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from this, if a man therefore purge himself from these, when you are going to, you know, be in a fellowship, in an assembly, there are things to purge yourself from. You may not feel dirty, but you have to brush your mouth when you are coming in the midst of other people. Because if you think, I brushed last night, and even do, and when I slept, I didn't have any dirty thing, then I can go out. It's unacceptable to the body, to the assembly, to the fellowship. They will say something incongruent with the fellowship. That's why we look at our lives and with the word of God, with the blood of the Lamb, and with the water of the Word, we wash ourselves because we're part of the body. If you say, well, I washed yesterday, I took my bath yesterday, I don't have to do that today. Yes, you have to. The sweating and the exposure to the environment and to the, uh, the uh, atmosphere demands that you wash. And so, as we're coming together, those who do, they do not wash and clean their mouths and watch the words coming out of them. Those who do not watch, wash and, and get rid of extraneous behavior that comes to them is not acceptable. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, if you talk every day like you talked one year ago, 11 months ago, 12 months ago, if you talk the same thing and people look back and say, oh, who is saying that? It means you have not been putting yourself you have not been looking at yourself in the mirror of the word of God because we're built together on the foundation in a holy habitation. We need to wash, we need to take care, and we need to have the behavior that is acceptable to the fellowship. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meat and feet and suitable for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. We're looking at Luke chapter 6 verse 46. Luke chapter 6 verse 46 and why call ye me Lord, Lord and do not the things which I say. What do you say? You are my disciple. You are my follower. I'm your Lord, I'm your master, and you are a Christian following after Christ. Show the evidence. Because there are people who say they're Christians and they do not do what Christ has said. Verse 47. In verse 47, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them I will show you to whom he is like. And in verse 48 he is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a, on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house each and could not shake it for it was built and founded upon a rock that's a Christian it's not shifting here and there it's not being um, shifted to another opinion, another idea, another principle, 
because it's founded, it's built upon the rock. It has a standing, steadfast conviction, built on Christ. Look at verse 49, verse 49, but he that heareth coming to church, he that heareth coming to Christ, he that heareth reading the Bible, he that heareth and, you know, uh, participating in the meetings that believers have, he that heareth and doeth not. It's like a man, a woman too, that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. Temptations come, it fell. Trials come, it fell. Suggestions come from the world, and it fell. And the principles of the world, and the pressure of the world, they come, and it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Look at number three here. Number three, the Christian baptized in the Spirit's fire. The Christian baptized in the Spirit's fire. So Christ will not say, because you are cold, because you are lukewarm, because you have lost your first love and your first zeal, because you have lost your passion, because another thing has taken your interest away. You're not focused anymore. You're not fervent anymore. You're not fiery anymore. I will spew thee out of my mouth. The Lord does not have to say to this Christian because he is baptized in the Spirit's fire. In Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 3, we're looking at verse 11. I did baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, this John talking about Jesus, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What makes the Christian worth his calling, worth his salt, and worth the name that he bears is that he has the spirit that envelopes him, baptizes him in fire. And because of the Spirit's fire, the people can see. When the fire is burning anywhere, you can feel the heat, you can see the shining and the burning and the light that it brings forth. And because the Christian is born, is built, and is baptized now in fire, people can see and tell. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, whose fan is in, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into his, into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The fire that came on the day of Pentecost. Look at that. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place praying. And then in verse 2, it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and uh, it filled all the house where they were sitting. Verse 3, it says in verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Matthew uh, chapter 3 verse 11 had said he'll baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This now is what we see and the fire came upon them, each of them, each of them, the fire that, you know, uh, drove the coldness away and drove the uh, lukewarmness away, the fire that brought the zeal and the passion and the false love and the courage and the bond 
burning earnestness that a Christian should have that fire brought that and then in verse 4 we're told it says in verse 4 and they were all, all of them, each of them, everyone filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, uh, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then in verse 38, verse 38 says, and then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you that's in water in the name by the authority of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise in verse 39 for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7 he Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7 and of the angels he says who maketh his angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. All those reptiles will not have a place in our system, on our back, in our stomach, in our bone. All those uh, insects, spiritual, will not uh, have any room in our system. All those uh, serpentine agents of the serpent, of the old serpent, will not have any place in our lives if the fire of the spirit is burning every time. And it's burning during the day, is burning during the night, and we can sleep without anything walking about because the fire of the Spirit will drive everyone away in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, the Christian as a believer, the Christian as a conqueror. Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 28. Acts chapter 26, verse 28. And a great then a great passage unto Paul, almost that persuades me to be a Christian. Even a great part knew who a Christian was, and he knew who a Christian is and he knew how a Christian will live. He said, I'm not there yet. I want to be. I desire to be. Almost, almost that persuades me to be a Christian. And then Paul replied, I don't want you to be almost. I want to be all together you. I want you to be all together as I am. We're looking at chapter 8 of Acts. Acts chapter 8, we're reading from verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. Opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. What if anytime somebody confronts me, anytime I confront somebody, anytime somebody crosses my way, I open my mouth and talk to him scripture. I talk about who I am in Christ. I talk about what I can do in Christ. I talk about what he has sent me to do through Christ. I talk about the power of Christ in my life that could be in his life. Whatever topic he's talking about, I open my mouth and I talk like Jesus will talk. That is the Christian. And then in verse, 30, in verse um, 36, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? In verse 37, verse 37, and Philip said, If thou believest, the Christian as a believer, believing the word, believing in the Savior, believing in life eternal, and believing everything that is reaching in the word, and living with conviction as he believes, living with consistency as 
he believes. And living with conversion, confession, as he believes, the believer, that's the Christian, and he becomes the conqueror. He tells, he tells, uh, he told uh, Philip when he said, if thou believeth, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 38. In verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, Philip and the eunuch, into the water. And Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. What did they have to both go down? Because Philip was not going to take a cup of water and sprinkle on his forehead. He was to immerse him in the water for water baptism. He baptized him in verse 39. It says, some when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Uh, there are those who are called converts, probably converts of men. They are happy when the one, the soul winner, is with them. And once the soul winner goes, it's like their joy has gone away with the soul winner. I don't have joy anymore. There are people when you come to church, I don't see this, I don't see that. And because they don't see the person, they didn't come for Christ and Christ alone, because they have not come for, they have come for him or for her. I didn't see her, I didn't see him. They don't have joy. Those are not Christians. The Christians are happy because the joy of salvation is inside them. Whoever is there, good. He comes to worship God. I also come to worship God. Whoever is not there, he might have his reason for not coming today. But I still have the joy because the joy of salvation is there. And he went on his way rejoicing. Then in verse 40, verse 40 we're told, but Philip was found at Azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The Christian as a believer and as a conqueror. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the Christian, a believer in his eternal love. The Christian, a believer in the eternal love of God. Number two, the Christian, a bearer of others' loads. Other people have loads. It's no more self-centered. It's no more self-focused. It's no more self-concentrated. It's no more me, me, me. He now thinks about other people because he's a Christian. And like Christ came to bear our body. This man, this woman, a bearer of others' laws, he shows that he's now a Christian. Number three, the Christian, the battle acts of the Lord. Look at number one. Number one, the Christian, a believer in his eternal love. In Acts chapter um, Acts of the Apostle chapter 4, we're looking at verse 14. It says, And believers were the more added unto the Lord, not just unto the church, unto the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. What kind of believers are these? They believe John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, the God of love, will, ha will not perish but have everlasting life. They believe in the eternal love of the Lord. He loved me. 
he loves me he will continue to love me look at first john chapter 4 verse 16 in first john chapter 4 verse 16 and we have known and believed the love that god has to us god is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in god and god in him. It is, the, it is the Christian. He believes in the love of God, in the love of Christ, what he has done for him, and that God still loves him. He's never dejected, he's never depressed, he's never kind of frustrated because he knows the eternal love of God for him, and he believes in that love. In verse 19, verse 19 says, we well, love him because he first loved us. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 13, uh, we having the same spirit of faith, believing, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have spoken. We also believe in that eternal love of God for us, and we speak. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at the Christian, the bearer of others' loads. It tells us in Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 2, Bear ye one another's bodies. Unbelievers don't do that. Unbelievers say, I have enough to think about. I have enough to chew. I have a lot on my plate. I cannot get up and help another person bear another person's burden. Unbelievers don't think about other people. Their lives, their thoughts, their plan, their purpose, their food, everything is for them and them alone. But he's the Christian because he's following Christ and because the nature of Christ is now on him and in him is able to answer to this, bear one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. In uh, Romans chapter 15, we're reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 15, we're reading from verse 1. We then that are strong, made strong by the Spirit of Christ in the Christian, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. And then in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, let every one of us please his neighbor, help his neighbor, uplift his neighbor, assist his neighbor, bear his neighbor's body to his good, to edification, for his good, to edification. And then in verse 3, it says, For even Christ, please not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Verse 4, in verse 4, for whatsoever things were reaching a full time, were reaching for our learning. Whatsoever things were reaching a full time in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the word that shows how disciples helped others, bore with others and bore their bodies. They were reaching a full time. They are reaching for our learning. That we, through patience, perseverance, and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. First John, chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
Christians are body bearers. They bear the bodies of others. They lead the yoke from other people. Verse 17, it says in verse 17, but also, eh, also as this was good. And says his brother, have need, need of comfort, need of counseling, need of food, need of clothing, need of necessities of life. Whoso as this was good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion upon him or from him, how dwelleth in him the love of God. How does he show that he is a confirmed, a comforting Christian? In verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Number three here, the Christian a battle acts of the Lord, the Christian, the believer, an instrument in the hand of the Lord that will convict others, that will compel others to come to Christ and thereby be converted. Look at Jeremiah chapter 51. Reading here from verse 20, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, for with thee will I break down in pieces, convict of their sins, make them confess, make them come to the Lord with thee. By your testimony, by your soul winning message, by your utterance and speaking on behalf of the Lord. With thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms, destroy the kingdoms of darkness, and bring the people out of their sin out of their bondage into the kingdom of light. The battle acts of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 15. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument. Have it is, thou shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. Verse 16, in verse 16, thou shalt find them and the wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them and thou shalt, thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. He makes us believers saved, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost and will become great instruments, threshing instruments, weapons in his hand not carnal weapons, but weapons of the Lord, so that our life, our message, our utterance will bring them, rush them, drive them, compel them to come to the Lord. And they pray and confess, and they become converted. Look at Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 37, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, the message of Peter, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall 
we do. In verse 38, verse 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness, the pardoning of your sins. And ye shall receive the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord shall call. Verse 40, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself, rescue yourself, separate yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41, then they that gladly received the word. He had convicted them that they were the people that slew, that killed, that crucified Christ. He had convicted them that their sin was responsible for putting Christ to death. And now, if they were going to have the mercy and the favor and the grace of God, they must come to the Lord and they must surrender fully, completely unto the Lord. And they, they were not offended. They didn't get angry. They didn't hate him for what he has said. Then they that gladly, cheerfully, happily received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Not only that they were converted, they continued. Look at verse 42. In verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. The Lord will make us threshing sharp instruments in Jesus' name. And our weapon will not be carnal. Our weapon will not be worldly. Our weapon will not be fleshly. Our weapon will not be the philosophy of men, the psychology of men, and the power of a human, uh, boisterous, courageous, natural strength. But it will be the power of the Lord and the strength of the Lord. As we speak the word, and the word brings conviction on the people and the words make them to remember their sin, their evil, their corruption and they have the burning heat of the world and the burning fire of the world that goats them, that challenges them, that drives them to the point of confession and faith and conviction in the Lord. May the Lord use our word, our service, and everything we have to bring people to Christ in multiplied thousands in Jesus' name. Amen. And all that we have heard will take root in our lives that in reality, in practical terms, in an experiential way, will be the Christian that follows Christ, that practices the word of Christ, and that is useful in the sight of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and take virtually everything we've learned, everything we've heard today to the Lord so that we will be who he wants us to be and do what he wants us to do and be as effective as the early Christians and everybody will see a light shining and will give their lives and the praises unto our God. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord.